<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting, fun-filled episode of Coffee or Beer, brought to you on behalf of Hold Tight TV. My guest today is the one, the only, Mr. Keith, Keithy Shackers. Hey, buddy, how's it going? It's going well. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon, Darren, whichever one it is on your side of the world, probably evening. It is evening for me, sir, and it's morning to you. So is my, it, uh, is it beer question. o'clock? Is it beer o'clock yet? Oh, you read my mind. Beat me to it. I'm on the beer o'clock. You're on the, what are you doing this I'm morning? A, I have a, a little uh, travel cup of coffee. Um, I'm drinking a star. I wish it was beer, <laughs> but it's a, it's a Starbucks Pike Place roast with a little wow. dash of cinnamon that I do every day in my almond milk and coffee. I love yep. almond milk and I love cinnamon. That's I'm jealous of you. Maybe we could just swap our drinks, right? <laughs> lovely, lovely. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I fancy a, a, a beer and I may need a, a hard drink after this week, but uh, coffee for now. Yeah. Well, cheers. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Pete. Hales. Pink. Pinky's out. Um, folks, um, Keithy is the chief editor for Ghost Cold Magazine. He's also a social media strategist and a digital marketing expert, which is all great, great words to me because I'm interested in all these things. But Keith, I think we should just make like good storytellers and good marketers and start at the beginning to spin ourselves our little thread here. So if you could just take us back to, because you've been in the industry now, music industry for what, over 20 years, like easily over 17 years? I think like, yeah, um, not quite 20, but 15 plus for sure. Okay, well, um, not even the door of a 20 year man here, so. Hey, thank you. First of all, I'm going to just record, I'm going to keep a recording of this and just play it on a loop every time I get down in the dumps, because this intro has been wonderful and I definitely don't feel worthy. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, this is my week to get interviewed and chatted up. So I'm getting a glow up. Uh, I'm normally the one asking the questions, but this is amazing and thank you for having me. Um, I'll, get, I'll give the, the 30 seconds of me and then uh, the 30 seconds of Ghost Cult. Um, I have been, I was a, a lifelong music maker for over 20 years that I did do. I played in bands. I did the scene in the pre-internet days, the pre-email days. I did a lot of guerrilla marketing. I used to go to like Metallica arena shows and flyer all the cars with my shows in the area. Um, I used to hand out demo tapes at Slipknot shows. And I, uh, I really came out of the New York City sort of, I was never a hardcore kid, but I, gra- I was around that area. Uh, my very first, some of my first experiences in music were hardcore shows, CBGBs, places like that in New York City. And then I kind of, I kind of, of course, I graduated. I went from kind of being like a theater, a musical theater kid and a progressive rock guy to being like a thrash metal kid as a teenager. And that kind of expanded into my playing days. But um, I got in, I went to journalism school originally, dropped out. Uh, so I nearly have a degree in broadcast journalism that I didn't complete. And um, I, had, I had my most successful couple of bands and then I kind of retired from making music. And I had always been kind of the guy who would share my musical, you know, I was just such a huge music consumer. Music has been like a best friend in my life to me. So I was always sending recommendations to friends, making mixtapes, making mix CDs, sending out emails on, I would get like the ice list, which is the old school list record stores used to get to set like what to buy. I would send out that list with like check marks, Metallica, Slayer, biohazard life of agony you know and that's how I would share music with my friends and uh, you know peers and then that kind of gra- gravitated into writing I had sort of a little professional writing experience and I hadn't done music and I sort of started like doing music blogging and that turned into writing for music websites uh, I worked previously to ghost cult at the is the uh, there used to be a equivalent of blabbermouth called metal army america which was actually owned by century media hats off to my century media fam past and present and um and then i ended up writing for another couple of music blogs that turned into things that are still around today and then i came on to ghost cult uh, which was founded in 2012 as a zine in europe um to cover road burn and desert fest basically and uh incubate festival rest in peace and things like that so avant-garde doom extreme metal things like that i came on to found the american team because metal army had uh folded and i went from 
running the American team as the, like a U.S. editor to taking over the whole brand within a year. And it just happened that way. It wasn't scripted. It just kind of fell into my lap. So Ghost Cult is going on nine years this October. I have been the owner for eight. I have worked for it for eight and a half. Um, we had tw a 20 issue run of actual digital magazines um, and that folded and it's going on five years. I say, I say all the time, I'm going to bring it back someday and I will bring it back someday as some kind of special thing, maybe a biannual or an annual, but we've been just a full on website ever since. For those that don't know, ghostcoatmag.com. We do music news, very similar to Blabbermouth or Metal Injection. We do interviews, podcasts. We were reviewing a huge clip of shows and festivals all over the world in the old times. I hope it's gonna come back. And uh, yeah, we've been working harder than ever. We just, um, I don't think a lot of people know this. We are part of the Blast Beat Network now. So Metal Sucks, Metal Injection, Metal Insider, uh, Cult Nation, PRP. We are one of those, you know, music websites, metal websites. So I like to think of us as sort of, you know, scrappy, but actually one of the, you know, maybe top better tier metal and rock websites in the world. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd agree. And uh, amen to the live shows coming back. I mean, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, some great achievements in there. What do you play it out of curiosity? What did you play it like? Oh, I was a singer and uh, I, um, I play bass and I play guitar badly. Um, I actually, once in a blue moon, I will, uh, I will get out my guitar. I haven't in a few months. I actually, so the last, uh, not the last album I put out, but one of the last major releases that I had was 20 years ago last, this time last year. So 21 years ago, last year during the pandemic, I took out one of my songs. I was trying to like honor that anniversary of my one semi-successful band. We opened for Testament, Doro, Shadows Fall with Phil Labonte. So we're going back quite a ways. Played a bunch of regional gigs, some pretty big gigs. Uh, and it kind of fizzled out after a while. Um, but I, I remastered and remixed one of those songs, the sort of song that I'm known for. And it's on Bandcamp, if anybody wants to check it out, it's pretty terrible. But uh, it's fun, it's a fun snapshot of me as a singer and a band leader. Um, the band was called Grunt, there are other bands called Grunt now. Uh, you can look us up on today's Bandcamp Friday when we're recording this. So it, uh, it was Grunt BX, so that if you want to, for Bronx, Bronx, New York, where I'm from. And uh, yeah, I mean, I love making music. I love being on stage. And uh, I, as much as, you know, we're all part of this machine where we support this huge infrastructure of major labels and bands and making it and distribution and all these things. I have always been a very DIY soul type of person. So I love underground bands. I always want to help unknown bands become known. And so that's my passion uh, for real. I love it. I love it. Now you've already alluded to some of these things already, but um, you've, if you could just maybe explain your experiences and what you've noticed over the years, how the music industry for bands, you know, has changed from what it was like being in a band or working in the industry 15 years ago, say just pre-internet maybe, and what it's like now and how, and how things are different. What's your experience been like? Awesome question. It's been wild. I wish that just on a personal level, I came along, I think, right at the sort of the end of the innocence before the internet age. I wish we had had MySpace because literally within like a year of sort of semi retiring from playing in bands, Trivium hit on MySpace and blew up. Parkway Drive hit on was one of the first Facebook bands. So I think about bands like that. I'm not saying that we would have had, we did not have similar talent. A, a little bit, but um, I would love to have seen what could have happened had I been around then. So my experience with the music industry was um, magazines. And that's actually really like how I, you know, really fostered my love and actually really wanted to become a music journalist. Um, and to a lesser extent, even a music marketer. Mar even my marketing for corporations and things has been inspired by bands and the music business. So it's really affected my life. But as a youngster, let's say, so there was no internet, there was no blabbermouth, there was no Twitter. Mm -hmm. And we had Metal Hammer. And we even in America, we had Metal Hammer and we had a terrorizer. They were very expensive to buy as import magazines, usually from Virgin Megastore or Tower Records or something. Um, I love Rip Magazine, which was headed by Lon Friend, who's one of my heroes in music journalism. 
Um, Metal Edge, of course, uh, had a long run. Metal Maniacs, of course, had a long run. My my band that I just described, Grunt, was in Metal Maniacs uh, in the in uh, one of the Bruce Dickinson comeback issues when he rejoined Maiden. So um, that was like our late gasp claim to fame. But um, what I've seen in terms of the changes are is really um, it's interesting. There was a time I know that this is still some bands still think this is how it is. You know, you, if you have management, if you have a publicist, if you have a support team, they just do everything for you. And it's, it's okay or good enough. I make music, I'm the artist, and that's got to be enough. And it really isn't. Because even at the label level, and you're seeing this now with blood blast distribution through nuclear blast, you really are seeing the onus is on the artist, you really are in the driver's seat of your career more than ever and, it, and a lot of bands don't know that they are and this is a kind of a sort of a curse and a blessing it's a bit of a gripe for me um you really can't just leave it up to anyone else to be in control of your vision of your merch of your marketing you have to have a stake in it it's not you're it's not good enough that you make music everyone makes music and a lot of it is not good or, or all along the same level. Like not just honestly, there's, I get a thousand emails a day. Uh, half of them are from music and half of them are from marketing work and, uh, and social media. And a lot of bands come across my desk and I'm very blunt. I, again, ultimately I wanna support and help people and encourage people, hey, you know, this is not right for us or hey, you could do this better or, you know, mm, the production's a little rough there but I see some potential in the songs. But like, so I try to have that function, but bands definitely don't understand their, where they are in the pyramid of importance of their own career, which is, you know, as opposed to back in the day, they see movies and they see the song remains the same and they see Led Zeppelin on a jet or they saw, you know, or even, you know, if you see, um, like Parkway had that movie last year, right? Uh, Viva La Underdogs, right? And you see how intense they care about their band even at this level where they're headlining festivals and they're so successful, they are, it, they have a hand in everything. Nothing, if anything is off, they know about it. They don't leave any, well, we're gonna just kick our feet back and let everybody take care of it for us. Even at their level, <clears throat> excuse me, even at their level, they are focused and have a hand in everything. And that's really admirable. And that's how underground bands, if you wanna get signed, if you wanna impress somebody else, that's how you have to act. All right, there's a lot here to, uh, to digest. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, 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 not at all. I mean, did you feel like, did you feel like the industry was saturated before the internet? Um, no. You think it's more saturated now than ever it's before? Much, it's much, I think just in general, there's a curve of technology through life that mm. as technology continues to become more accessible, people more people start bands. Uh, there's going to be a million bands during the pandemic of people who had put the guitar or the microphone down or the drums down, who had the time to go back to their craft. Um, I think the ability to communicate has made people perhaps think it's easier than ever to make it. I don't know if that's true. I think it's just as hard as ever to make it actually to really make it uh, to, to get your music out there and be successful even on an underground DIY level. Again, just to put your own music out on Bandcamp at a reasonable clip, grow a following, use email marketing, reach people on social media in a meaningful, cool way that isn't trite and dumb and contrived. Um, you know, Let's explore that a little bit. Let's explore that a little bit because we probably both do and see the same things. So <clears throat> when you say social media ads and triteness and that kind of stuff, I mean, it's a hard one to kind of explain, but generally, are you signed to see the sort of same style of ads? Is that what you kind of mean? Or do oh, you... yeah. Oh, I mean, in, ge in general, across the board. But yeah, advertising is largely, if you have a bare minimum effort, you can get in front of people because the mechanisms are there. Uh, at this point, Facebook is a, is a wasteland where no one sees their friends' posts. So advertising is one of the few ways you can get in front of people. I have seen ad, uh, bands do phenomenal things with advertising. I have seen small, small labels grow their footprint enormously just because of social media and ads. However, the downside is there's a lot of sameness and there's a lot of people who, you know, if you don't, if you don't lack the skills, if I don't lack the skills for something, I go learn them or hire someone who knows how to do what I don't know how to do. 
Uh, I just had a client in the corporate world ask me if I knew how to do an animated video. I was like, I know how to do a lot of things. I don't know how to animate anything. I'm a terrible artist, uh, draw, you know, in terms of drawing and, uh, you know, animating a drawing of mine would be, you know, like a nightmare uh, for most people and would look like awful. So just to interject here, doodly. Have you heard of doodly? Yes. Yeah, that's the first thing that jumps to my mind in case they need yes. that. Yes, they do. And uh, he was like, should I go to Fiverr? I was like, no, not everything. Fiverr's awesome. I'm on Fiverr, but uh, you shouldn't do Fiverr for everything. And, um, but uh, yeah, there is a lot of sameness on social media. There's a lot of people who are not, you know, they just feel like uh, I'm, I'm on, the, I'm, I'm squatting the platform. My name is there. And sometimes I say that is the bare minimum. You need to at least every new platform that pops up, you should jump on the first day and squat your band name. There is, uh, you know, a Google search will help you out. A lot of bands have the same name or a similar name. I had a, uh, a dabble in music PR. We'll talk about this at the end here about music marketing and PR, but I dabble in a little DIY underground PR. I do a handful of bands a year. I just did sort of a proto punk, proto heavy metal band that I got into the obelisk, shout out to the obelisk and JJ. And uh, that's Pyre Fire from New Jersey for people who like that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, there's a way to go about it to get your band attention. And they are, you know, like they're not big fans of social media just to speak honestly about them, but what they do well is Instagram. So they smartly, at least the one platform they like is the most important one today beside YouTube. And they, uh, they do really well at Instagram. They're on there a lot, they do fun things. And I appreciate about that about them. So you don't have, you know, obviously look, we live in a toxic time everything is shit. Unfortunately, everybody's angry at everybody. Twitter is a cesspool, but you need social media. It's a tool. It's mm. not, don't, even if you don't like it or you're nervous about it or you're, that's fine. Be nervous, be, you know, hire somebody like me to help you with your social media or hire someone else that does it to do it for you. Or um, I see that a lot, let's say this, here's something you can answer for me. Mm. I kind of feel like a lot of publicity brands, labels, they don't do as well on social media as they think they do. Mm. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that actually, in my experience, very few of them even do it. So it's not even doing it above their, what they think they're, how well they're doing. They're also just not doing it. Right. Uh, there are more that I can think of that probably don't do any advertising and they leave it purely to sort of organic um, and think that what they've done for the past 10 years is going to work for the next and they're kind of slowly sliding down a hill blindfolded. It's almost, you know, it's kind of, I also feel like maybe that's kind of um, um, inherent of the um, metal and rock industry. But it feels like the world of rock, metal, rock and roll, metal, all those sub subgenres as well, are always just a step behind everyone else or other other genres, even in the music industry. Do you do you agree? It's like for some reason, yes. And I know that people like to deride pop stars and pop popularity like oh they got too popular and I hate them now it's like okay that's I understand that vibe and why that is a thing but look at look at pop stars look at them and see how they manage their social media uh, I had a corporate client when I worked in the agency world a few years ago I, I like to consider myself a refugee from the agency world the ad agency world and the PR agency world the major PR not entertainment and uh, I'm a consultant now in my professional life beside Ghost Cult. And uh, we had, one of our clients had Demi Lovato as a spokesperson. And uh, by all accounts, by the way, she's wonderful and really great. And I know that she's had some struggles and I think about that all the time. Uh, even a person of her level of success, she has real people problems, by the way. She is brilliant at social media, not just that her team does it for her. She's personally invested in her social media. So when TikTok came out, she was on it. Snapchat was a thing for a while. She was on it. She's really great at Instagram stories. She knows exactly what her fans want from her. She does not give a fuck about wearing a Black Dahlia Murder shirt and blasting Black Dahlia Murder in her car uh, and, and talking about her love of metalcore and deathcore and Ozzy and stuff. So she doesn't care. She's well, on one hand, she knows exactly how to reach her fans and talk to them about what they want to hear about, but she's still who she is. I know... Um, the internet likes to get angry when people wear uh, shirts of a band they don't like, right? Yeah. Um, well, they've never who, listened to me. Right, and who cares? Yeah. It's it's fashion. You know what? Slayer claims that they sold like 10 million shirts because Rihanna and uh, Kylie Jenner wore a Slayer shirt. Yo, good for them. Yes. Yeah. 
Slayer. Yeah. If anyone should sell 10 million shirts, it should have been Slayer. Good for them. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, don't be angry that somebody is wearing a Slayer shirt. Be like, oh, wow, they're helping promote. Maybe one kid will hear Slayer and be like, I've been waiting my whole life to hear Angel of Death. Oh, my God. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, but it is it is interesting. Um, the sameness of a lot of things is like be a little more daring, be a little more inventive, be a little more creative. Obviously, look at what's working. And I'm always a double down kind of guy. If something is working, do it again and do it more. But at the same time, look at what people are doing who are really saying something unique and special to their fans and see what you can do. You don't have to copy them, but you can take something from that and say, what can I do to do something similar in my own way? This is a really, really good point. And it's, um, and it's something that I, I'm kind of learning to, to do more, I, I, I hope, and get better at. It's like, basically, one of the reasons... Keith, I think what you're saying this, uh, why you're saying that bands need to get used to doing this themselves and not relinquish control of, of their marketing skills and all the rest of that is because I can't like sit here and represent uh, uh, dozens of bands, social media advertising accounts and be like, all one size will fit all for all of you here. So I'll just like plug and play you the same way I do everybody else and it will work because that, that doesn't work. So it's like, and I also don't have the time, but physically don't have the mad hours to go down into the nitty gritty, like micro level of like experimenting with all these different kinds of ads to find out the winning ones that work and have all the creativity and the difference about them. And then test them all for dozens and dozens of people. So like the fact that a band should do that themselves and come up with these creative ideas, create engaging content that's funny or that's just like different or whatever it is, as long as it's kind of authentic from, from, from their point of view, then, then you can hand it over to someone else to do the deployment for you. But like the actual figuring out, that's why you're saying don't relinquish that control and improve your skills at it, right? And okay. uh, just, just to ask you this as well, are you a fan of picking a lane? Then Are you a fan of, like, of picking your favorite platform as, as opposed to being omnipresent? You'd say go hard it, on one platform? It, it's a challenge, right? Because everybody else is trying to be omnipresent. And there even I talk about this among my peers who run websites. The challenge for all of us is, is how do you, how do we do this week in and week out? And they have a full-time job. So like, how do we do this? Um, Ghost Cult is my passion and I'm just good at, I will be fortunately an expert in social media and I'm, I'm particularly skilled at it. So it's been easy. And I've actually done this at multiple music brands where I've grown the platforms and the following. Uh, it's harder to do that now as likes and follows are shifting and changing what they are. Mm -hmm. um, I do agree that if you have a thing you're particularly great at, you should focus on it, but you can't abandon them all. And so what I often suggest, and so here's, there's two folds here. One thing I like to, every band has, I don't know, three, four, five people. One of you can each take a channel. And even if it's not natural to you, that can be your responsibility to just, mm -hmm. even if it's just monitoring it, because mm -hmm. you need to be in charge, you know, as, uh, as Prince liked to say, if you're not in charge of media, media is in charge of you. And so <laughs> yeah. media is going to be on top of you if you're not on top of it is actually what he said. And so, you know, each member of the band can pick a lane they are comfortable in or just pick one because someone has to do them and learn all the ins and outs of the platform and, and learn how to listen. Probably the most important thing in social media is not the posting. It's the social listening. It's monitoring your audience in real time. And it sounds like a lot of work and it's a little bit of work if you learn how to do it or hire someone who can. The other thing I'm gonna say is, and uh, this is kind of how my music marketing ties in, is I see a lot of mistakes, really easy mistakes made by bands. On the journalism side, mm -hmm. if you're a band and you have, an, you have a premiere coming up at a website, let's say Metal Underground or, or Kerrang! or Metal Hammer or blank, Metal Sucks or Ghost Cult, and your publicist or your managers are working to get the assets to that person. Don't screw it up and do what you want to do. Uh, if if they're telling you the link needs to be unlisted on YouTube, do it. Mm. Don't then change it later because you think you're smart. If yeah. they tell you, if they tell you, listen, a site like Kerrang is going to want an embargo for a day, a whole physical day, where you don't post that video, only a teaser not the full video. They don't want you to post that on Facebook. They don't want you to post it on your IG at all. They want the rights to share that video. First of all, it's going to help you. In most cases, all the social media traffic is still going to count to your accounts. So if you get 
a thousands of plays from Karang sharing your video, awesome. And then you actually set it to public and you then know Karang got us this much. Here's how much we're worth on our own after. And here's the result of that after. So it's actually really, it's how you become data driven as a marketer, right? Because this is something I'm, I'm very big on. Even if you don't like numbers, I got into music to not have a job, right? I, did, I used to say that all the time. I got into metal to not be a scientist and have to learn how to do Zoom, but here we are. And so, uh, or be in front of the camera, which I never thought I was going to be in my life, like on our YouTube show. But here we are every week with a new show. And so, um, you know, this is what it is. You have to do the uncomfortable. Success begins outside of your comfort zone. And so each band member can take a platform. You can have one thing that you're excellent at. Oh, we got like 10,000 followers on IG. Amazing. But you can't neglect the others. So pick it, appoint someone appoint someone to be the point person in your band or multiple people to be the social media point people and learn those platforms. Take the time, invest in yourself. It's an investment in your career, in your future, if you want to have one. Do you see, what do you, what are some predictions that you have here for oh, where uh, things are going with, with press, with, with journalism? <clears throat> so here's another funny thing. And again, this is uh, such a treat for me to get to chat with you about this. There's definitely a love hate relationship between publicists and journalists. And I'm gonna put on my ghost cult chief Keefe hat for a minute, my, my hat, my trucker hat as usual, uh, and say there is definitely a weird prickly relationship. In the past, you know, publicists job is to get brand awareness for their artists across the board, whether it's metal or toothbrushes. And, and I would say that a lot of stuff that I have learned trying to sell toothbrushes or cancer medicine or you know, uh, cell phones is the same stuff applies to music. Right. That's just number one, just in terms of just sharing the, word, the, the messages. Uh, the problem is that I understand that some journalists are punishers. So they continually nag or they continually listen. Like, I know I'm not going to get in it. I've interviewed Ozzy in a group setting 10 years ago once. And I got to ask him one question and I did get to meet him. And it's a really funny story. I can tell some time about uh, meeting him and chatting with him for a second and interviewing him for one question. But at this point, even our website is successful as we have been after over eight years. I'm probably not going to get to talk to Ozzy one-on-one -on -one for his next hour. Maybe I will. I'm not going to go break the chops of his publicist who I know for 15 years. Can I get Ozzy? Can I get Ozzy? Can I get Ozzy? Because I know the answer is probably no. But I'm happy to support every one of their other artists you know, that same publicist also has Wardruda. That same publicist has a bunch of other bands that are awesome. So I want to talk to those artists too. Mm -hmm. um, that being, there is definitely a weird love and hate relationship where publicists need journalists to cover their artists, write reviews, do interviews, do press, write stories, cover news. And then there's also like, a, I feel like a lot of publicists are irritated and pissed off at journalists a lot. And listen, most people doing music journalism or have a music website, have a blog. They're doing this for free. There's very little money in it. I have luckily, uh, you know, made some money in my career being a reviewer and a writer. It's not a, you know, it's not Scrooge McDuck diving in a vault of coins. It's not <laughs> happening. Uh, there's a handful of, you know, your biggest sites in the world, your loud wires, your pitchforks, your kerangs, your metal hammers. And either they came from the magazine world or they built this incredible digital footprint. We're on our way to something like that. I don't think we're ever going to have that kind of wild, you know, vastness uh, of reach, but I, I like to think that we're, you know, right there in the middle between sort of a decibel and a metal injection somewhere and, uh, you know, doing our thing, even though, again, I love decibel and I respect metal injection. They do great things, things that I don't think we will do. But, um, you know, at the same time, I know there's a sort of vlogging is a huge thing now. I never, you know, I wish I had invested in YouTube years earlier mm -hmm. now because uh, I see the power of it and I see how successful it is just in general as a, plat as a sort of generation platform, it is the second or third most searched website in the world. Mm -hmm. So I tell every band, start your own podcast, start your own YouTube channel, even if it's just to react to things, even if it's just to hang out with your fans, engage your fans. But in terms of where this is going, um, I know there's a lot of debate about reviews being irrelevant. Um, I know a lot of artists feel like reviewers, now that everybody can kind of be a reviewer and the platforms all give a certain amount of power to everybody, maybe reviewers are somehow not relevant anymore. I would argue and say they're more relevant than ever, especially because people have so much overstimulation and so many options. Mm. You need, you need if, a, if you trust a reviewer, any reviewer, 
you know, if you love the needle drop and you love Anthony and you watch his stuff and you really have faith in his taste, mm -hmm. let that be your guide, man. Mm -hmm. Because it's there's so much noise out there. I miss I miss out on bands because I'm overwhelmed with emails, I'm overwhelmed with work, I'm overwhelmed running the site and social media, and mm -hmm. I will miss a band. I will miss somebody cool, and then I'll find out about it. You know, there's every year we do a we don't do a lot of listicles and lists. It's just not what we do in general. Um, occasionally we do some stuff like that on YouTube, but generally we don't do like the top 15 metal singers ever. I have no interest. For some reason the dogs are going crazy, but um, welcome, welcome to the morning. Um, but uh, we don't do them except at the end of the year. We do the end of year list because people seem to like, they, they get plugged into that kind of idea that like, oh, what are the top albums of the year? What did I miss? And my own staff, we have a staff of like 60 people and 35, 40 of them are writers. I will learn about albums I overlooked underground. Sometimes a major album will come out and I'll be like, I don't have time to listen to this Chevelle album. That's the new Chevelle is out today. And I, I have yet to hear it other than the singles and I will try to go listen to it, but maybe I'm gonna end up not hearing it until later in the year. So um, reviewers still are important. Music journalists are still important. Good interviewers are crucially important. Artist, publicists want artists to tell their story. That's the most authentic way to reach fans is to have them tell their story why do you do what you do how did you do this that's what people that's what fans still want to know so i feel like a good music journalist if you strive to you know have a certain level of excellence at a certain level of uh, you know consciousness you can really make a mark still despite the flood of websites despite the flood of information out there that's why i think people every day want to still do this mm. they the, the world needs filters it's uh, it does. It's a filter. It's like that's why, that's why, and that's why Amazon reviews exist because everyone that buys something on Amazon, they scroll down and check the reviews first and make sure that what they're about to buy is worth the five quid or the twelve ninety nine or the thirty thousand pound thing because everyone's vouching for it. And so that's and that's why in an oversaturated market, you need people like yourselves and whoever can find the time to sift through it all and then offer up what's good. Um, Otherwise, it's just, it's just, there's just too much, and then it's analysis by paralysis, and nothing really gets done. And uh, mm. um, yeah, I mean, Christ, we could talk for so long, but I, I, I realize I don't want to run over too much. So I was going to bring go on to the fact now that you're going to do something really exciting for bands, for artists that they're going to get a lot of value from. Um, it's a pay what you can um, service, or it's basically free, but you can pay what you can, and people people should. It's called the 13 Day PR Challenge, and you are part of this. Right. What idea so uh i for a long time i have been in addition to doing ghost cult and ghost cult interviews i did a series of podcasts called the dumb and dumbest podcast i ended up as a, i start again this just seems to be my course in life i uh i started as a guest i started becoming a regular guest i ended up becoming a co-host i ended up producing the podcast a little bit and getting guests for the show and uh, hosting it at Ghost Cult, it just made sense. We aligned. Uh, from there, I went on to be part of the Daily Music Business Podcast, which people know from the Sound Talent Media Network. Doc Coyle is there with the X-Man Podcast, and they do a bunch of music industry podcasts. I did a bunch of those. And uh, I'm actually launching a new music industry podcast myself soon, uh, within a few weeks. Um, and so from this, we, you know, we would do these things um, <clears throat> Part of what I do and why I do is to teach people how to do it the right way, whether it's professionally in marketing and media, whether it's with bands, whether it's with journalism. I see myself as kind of a mentoring type of person. That's just my personality. I want to, I want everyone to, you know, uh, high tide raises all ships, right? I want everybody to, I wish everybody would, you know, review a certain way. I wish everybody would carry themselves on social media a certain way. So one of the things that we started to do together was teach and train bands. Um, I joined, again, the podcast partners. They had been doing some teaching and training, uh, sort of private, small, limited, uh, via Facebook or other things where we would, you know, teach, uh, you know, uh, 30 days on PR, how to hire a publicist and what, how to do a publicity campaign, just DIY for yourself. If you can't afford a publicist, mm -hmm. uh, do you need a publicist? How do you sell, how do you use your email marketing to sell things? How do you, carry yourself on social media? How do you build your own community, your own tribe on social media? So we did a series of these for like a year and a half. And um, we started a free group on Facebook, which everybody can join. This is the Music Marketing Mixer. I am one of the admins. 
And uh, we encourage everybody, labels, bands, everybody. It's not for self-promotion. It's not another place where you're going to just spam links to your stuff. That's not what we do. We're trying. Well, there are days during the week when we do self-promotion and share links like Bandcamp Friday. We let everybody share their stuff. But we really are trying to ask questions and get help. That's what we're trying to do. How do I do this on YouTube? How do I get started on Twitch? How do I blank? So that's what we started. And now we have decided to bring back the challenges. We're doing this 13 day challenge um, and I'm gonna name check some people. It's myself from Ghost Cult and my brand. It's uh, Corey Westbrook who writes for Metal Injection. It's Monica Strutt from The Last Martyr who's also a music marketing expert and she's a podcaster. It's Curtis Dewar of Dewar PR. It's Keith Morash of Infecting Cells. It's musical artists like Gaia Garda from Canada, who's an excellent uh, metal artist. Um, it's uh, Jesse Bay from Alternative Control Blog and Owl Maker and Turkey Vulture. So you have this breadth of experience of publicists, people who are musical artists, people who are music marketers, people who have been in bands and journalists all coming together to teach a series of lessons basically for free or if you can pay, pay what you want. Um, the response has been amazing. Uh, in the past, our paid seminars have been not overpriced but not cheap because they were very intensive we would give away a lot of value we always give much more value this is literally dirt cheap for two weeks and it's going to live in a facebook group that will be up forever theoretically uh we're not going to take it down if facebook takes it down i can't help you but it's going to it's you don't have to do it daily it's better if we all do it together like a collective but you know that's how you get the most help but I feel like there's just so little info out there for bands. And there are experts that do this. There are people that teach and train. But I just feel like if you make it available to everybody, it's the best possible thing. Absolutely. Is it like a, um, do you, will there be a, um, a host who kind of asks you all questions or are you going off sort of questions? That are we're we're going to do, uh, each day will be a different area of music marketing. So generally it's how to launch a PR campaign as the overall umbrella, but each element do I, can I do it by myself or do I need to hire someone? But if I'm going to do a DIY PR campaign, what are the steps? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to manage my social media, what's the quickest path to success and how do I do that? How do I approach my album artwork and my band photos? Oh, so many terrible band photos. And so, so many, many terrible, terrible, band. terrible band photos. Like your friend should not <laughs> be taking your band photo with their cell phone. Yeah, I know. And the front man should be at the front usually and the lighting you know i know you if you're, you're a black metal band and you want to be dark and mysterious and not have any information out there cool no one's going to find out who you are though i love i love aura and mystery tell them a good story rather than no story so these mm -hmm. are things that we're going to teach every day and then there will be a q a element like we're going to teach a lesson we're going to give out information and then uh and i think in a, a more novel way we're going to do some of it over on video as well like we're all going to shoot little videos and write a write up. So, um, but yeah, these lessons used to be fairly intensive and uh, I may bring them back at some point. I'm thinking about bringing back these seminars. Um, I don't, I only partner with people who I trust and I think know what they're talking about. I would never give advice that I wouldn't take myself when I was an artist or a band. Again, I wish I had all these tools back when I played music 20 years ago, 20, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago when I had bands. And, uh, Ultimately, again, at, the, at, at free or almost nothing, you can't beat that. No, absolutely not. So it starts from the 15th of March and yes. the live seminar that basically people can watch and then the recordings will be on the music uh, marketing mixer page. That's right. And you can just join that for free at any time. It's, uh, you know, facebook.com music marketing mixer. And by the way, it's an, even though we're all kind of metalheads or metal publicists or metal website people, we have a lot of people in the group that are not metalheads, just in case anybody out there is wondering. And we let, you know, everybody's equal to us. You can learn things from them. They can learn things from you. Um, look at the success of pop and, and rap music and hip hop and dance music. And look at how good they are at marketing and talking to their audience and look at how bad bands do, especially metal and punk and rock bands. Totally. Yeah. These are transferable skills. It doesn't matter what the genre is. Um, getting better at marketing and, and advertising and PR and all the rest of it. It doesn't matter what the genre is. It sounds fantastic. And I'm going to join it. And I'm also going to put the link to the Music Marketing Mixer in the description box below. So try to get some, as many people over to you as possible. Um, this has been great. And uh, Keith, we could talk for, for hours. Um, but... Maybe we'll just have you back on the show uh, again. So it'd be great. 
I would love to come back anytime. Much love to the whole tight family. Cheers to you, man. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat for me to share my story and, on, and be on the other side for a change. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great talking to you and it's awesome for me personally. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, right. Thank you for watching, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed that episode, and I'll catch you on the next episode of Coffee or Beer. Laters! <laughs> oh, no.